Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapters uh, seven, or sorry, 16. We have been in the book of Acts. <clears throat> we have a fascinating story today that barely needs a introduction, but just to help catch everyone up, we are in Philippi, a Macedonian province, in the Macedonian province, the city called Philippi. And you may be aware of the letter of Philippians. These are the people that the Apostle Paul writes to later on. And they are in Philippi and they led a woman to the Lord named Lydia and her entire household. And now Lydia's home has become a church. Isn't that cool? And now they meet in the church and they're doing ministry in Philippi for some days. And then the gospel encounters uh, spiritual warfare. The apostles encounter the kingdom of darkness. And we're going to read about that today and what happens. <clears throat> and just so you know, even what I just taught about, even what I just spoke about, that's spiritual warfare too. Who do you think wants you to never hang out with God all week? And one of the ways he does that is to distract you with busyness and stuff and other things. If the devil can get you away from God, he can begin to influence you to go a different way. And so one of the greatest ways that we fight spiritually is by just being in the presence of the Lord in our personal time before we ever come to church. So be aware this week, watch out because the devil is like a lion seeking whom he may devour, the scriptures say. And I, I don't know why I'm being so serious, but I do find that serious because I care about you as a pastor and as a fellow believer and a, and a Christian right alongside with you following Jesus. And he is, the devil is slick at getting us off track. And we're gonna see here that the gospel though is greater, the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Amen. Verse 16 says, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, this is the same place they met Lydia in the last portion of our scripture. So they're going to do an evangelistic trip here when they go to this place of prayer. It's where the believers or God-fearing Jews were at the time and they found Lydia and they led her to the Lord. So now they're going back to this place of prayer. So this is an evangelistic trip. Okay, Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Luke. And one day as they were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. Hmm. Interesting. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God. Notice capital letters. And they have come to tell you how to be saved. So even a demon recognizes who they're talking about. And they're telling you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated, so tired of it, that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. What we see here is a terrible thing. Mankind exploiting a young girl who is possessed by a demon to make them money. Just so you know, this exists in our world today. In the sex slave trade. Children, even men now. Children, boys and girls, women being used for financial gain. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? And in this society, there was false worship, false idols that people worship. And so demons knew that. And so they would cling to people or work or possess people who worship them. And we see here in the Greek or the words, a spirit by which she predicted the future in English, 
those words in our scripture, in the Greek, it translates into two words, a spirit and a python. Snake. And this concept goes back to the Greek city of Delphi where the God of Apollo was believed to be embodied in a python snake. So they would worship this snake and they would worship Apollo. And the original priestess at Delphi was purported to be possessed by Apollo and thereby able to predict the future. And therefore anyone possessed by the python spirit could foretell coming events. So we see here in scripture that even demons and the devil have power to do things on earth. This is a reality, just so you know. We can't put our, our head under the, a rock or hide in a rock or under a mat or whatever, or close our ears to this. The devil can give power and demons can give people power. And in this case, to predict the future. And so I would encourage you as believers or as people who possibly are here seekers of God and seeking who Jesus is and open to believing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to be very careful and to not play around with this kind of witchcraft in our world. The main reason why is because God says not to in Deuteronomy 18.10, but to go further with that, he also teaches us in the, word, in the word that the devil is the king of lies. So you can't trust everything they're saying. And I would also say that if you're, if you're feeling tempted to use mediums to speak to your family that have already passed, that is also wrong in scripture. It may mean that you, idolatry, or you have idolatry towards people over God. Maybe you've never heard it this way, but if we want to talk to our parents instead of obeying the word of God, then we put our people over God. It's a form of idolatry to put people over God and to want them so bad that we want to hear them from another realm. This is real. This stuff happens. And demons will give people the ability to do this. You cannot trust it because it's done by the king of lies, Satan. God also doesn't call us to know the future the way we want. If we're hungry for the future and we want to know the future for whatever gain or whatever reason, that is not living by faith. That's us trying to live by certainty. And the Bible calls us to live by faith and to trust the one who knows the future, which is God. And to trust that he's working out all things in his will for our good. And so I would urge you as a pastor and as a friend, as a believer, fellow believer, do not give any business to any fortune tellers, mediums, or any type of divination. Amen? There's another reason why, though. It means we're promoting someone being enslaved by a demon. It means you're okay with the devil's work and you're okay with someone being possessed by a demon to give you answers. And in this story, we see a terrible thing turn to something good. God delivers a young girl from slavery being enslaved by a demon and sin. Praise God. So the gospel sets a young girl free and then hurts a business. And I want every evil business to go out of business. Amen. By the way, if you thought that it was boring to do the will of God, then read this chapter again. That's intense and exciting. But not that we want to provoke anything, but the gospel does provoke spiritual warfare. Because we're going to come against powers and principalities of this world as we bring the kingdom of light and the kingdom of God. If we keep moving forward, we see that it does disturb a thriving business. Verse 19 says, her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city, the whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials, the Roman government at that time. Now they, they falsely proclaimed what was going on. They did not say what really happened. They twisted the narrative. 
Ready for this? They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. That wasn't true. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. So just like that, you set a girl free from a demon and now you're being beaten, falsely uh, accused and imprisoned. And now you're in the inner dungeon where it's impossible to get out. And not only that, they put their feet in wooden stocks, which means they would stretch their legs out and put a wood plank between their legs and their legs would be fastened to this wood plank so they could not walk or run out of that prison. They would not be able to escape. And here they are in the middle of all this for doing God's work. I think God had another plan, don't you? How did they handle this? How did God handle this? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. Can we just pause there for a moment? Doesn't that convict you a little bit? <laughs> okay, this is uh, a beating with rods. You be bloodied, bruised, hurting, very bad. Okay, this would be one of three times Paul was beaten with rods, according to scripture. You'd be in pain, severe pain. It wasn't the flogging that Jesus received necessarily, but it was bad. And you've been mistreated wrongly here, unjustly imprisoned, lied about what you were doing. The truth wasn't there. They were not, it was not, they didn't get represented properly at all. They were never even given a chance to tell their side of the story. They were imprisoned. And the first thing they do is worship and pray. That's convicting, isn't it? It makes you want to rethink how we handle our trials. Amen. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Now, just think about this for a moment. Some might say, oh, that's why they were able to get out because there was an earthquake and that was natural. It happened naturally. No, this was a supernatural earthquake. Surely, okay, yeah, maybe a natural earthquake could cause the hinges to come off or for the jail cell doors to go up and then fall off. But what about the shackles and the chains? Because if I'm worshiping and singing out to God, my chains are on my wrist, on my stomach, and my body's shaking during this earthquake, but nothing's falling off in that case or scenario. What it is, is it's a supernatural work of God responding to the prayer and the worship of his people, setting them free. Amen. Amen. You're in an inner dark place of your life. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there now. God will meet you where you are. I know that this isn't about this. This is about Christian persecution. But for those who have been through this in other countries, even today or around the world or in history, God meets them in the inner cells, in the darkest place that they've ever been in. God shows up when we pray and we worship. He is transcendent. His spirit can go anywhere. Don't you dare say God is not there for you. He is and he will be if you call out his name. Give him a chance. And keep giving him a chance if he hasn't shown up yet. His timing is perfect. He'll meet you where you are. Maybe in the inner recesses of your heart, you're struggling to let go of something. You're struggling to let go of an addiction or whatever it may be, something that's been done to you in the past. Just so you know, God sees it, he knows it, and he wants to help today. He wants to help today. Nothing that's ever been said about you or done to you is greater than his grace. And he can change your heart and your life today. We keep going here. 
In verse 27, it says, the jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. Uh Uh-oh, he's in trouble. (laughs) He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Someone's been listening. Just when you think that no one was hearing your testimony, just when you think no one saw you praying at work, just when you thought no one saw you at the restaurant, how you treated your waitress with love and grace, whatever it may be, people have been watching or listening. And God uses your testimony to minister to the people around you. He'll use your trials. So I would encourage us all to go through our trials with grace. To remember that God wants to use even that. He'll redeem it. You're gonna get in some tough times, but God knows how to turn it for his good and for your good. And for the good of those who are watching. What must I do to be saved? What an amazing question. Obviously, God got a hold of his heart. The grace of God flooded him. He saw this supernatural miracle at midnight. And he's like, I believe. <laughs> what do I got to do to be saved? And it's, it's funny because the answer is right here. They reply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. This is huge. There wasn't a list of things you got to do first. It was believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, obviously, we all know this by now because you've heard me teach this. Belief comes with repentance. In other words, you turn from your old beliefs to a new belief. So if you believe something new, like the way, the truth, and life, Jesus Christ, if you believe in that, you have to unbelieve everything else you've believed. And we don't realize how many things we believed until we come to Christ and realize it's him that we need to believe in. And when he came, he said we were sinners but that he would come and die for us. So we have to believe that we're sinners and therefore we must accept what Christ has done for us on the cross. There's, there's a few things we must believe. Now, for, for all of us, just so you know and just so we can understand, we won't know everything the first day of salvation. That's why discipleship is so important. That after someone believes the basic understanding that we need Jesus and they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we continue to teach them what it means afterwards. That's why I need you, church, to help me disciple people. So they fully understand everything. Sometimes people take the journey of understanding more before they believe. Great, either way, we want to make sure people understand who Jesus says and what he's done for them. Amen? So let's read what happens next. They shared the word of the Lord with him, verse 22, and with all who lived in his household. So they took time to explain the life and the story and the scriptures about Jesus Christ. So apparently there was a house nearby. The jailer must have lived close to the prison. And verse 33 says, even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. How about that 180? That's just a complete turnaround. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized because they had believed in Jesus Christ. So they got water baptized, most likely by a nearby pool. Many homes back then had pools too outside. And he brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Wow. How do you reach a jailer? Only God knows how to do that. Isn't God a mysterious, creative, redemptive worker? Like you're thinking, oh man, I'm done. You're in, you're in that position, you know, maybe we're, we're not Paul, right? Maybe we're in this position and we're thinking, well, this is it. I'm done for. And God shows up and does a miracle. And on top of that, he leads an entire family to the Lord. Only God can do things like that. There are people that you don't think maybe will ever get saved. And then all of a sudden, God does his thing. And he works in his mysterious, creative ways. And next thing you know it, they're talking to you saying, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? I've heard it many times. 
God knows how to turn your trial into a testimony that leads people to Jesus Christ. The next morning, the city officials, verse 35, sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. Um, but, the, but Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison. And we are Roman citizens, so now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Ah, he's wise. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. You know why they begged them to leave the city, right? Because they'd be in trouble if they stay around and find out. If everyone finds out what happened under this person's leadership, they'd be in trouble. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. That's it. They left Philippi just like that. But here's what's interesting. Do you think Paul is being vindictive a little bit and saying, hey, we're Roman citizens. You come get us out. I don't think so. You know what I think it was? I think Paul was setting up some peace for the church that would still be there. They realized they made a mistake. So now we better back off from persecuting these believers, these Christians, the people of the way, the way of Jesus Christ. We better back off I think Paul was being led by God to give them some peace for a little while instead of persecution. I think Paul also went through the persecution to teach the Roman citizens how to suffer by the Romans. Instead of, instead of appealing to his afforded citizenship and all the rights therein, he decided not to. He decided to suffer with Christ. He could have easily said, you can't do this, I'm a Roman citizen, but instead he went through it. And God used that to reach a family. Isn't God good? As much as I want to throw some kind of, you know, fight for my rights and all those things, there are some things that God is wanting to or allowing us to go through so that there will be a testimony of the grace and the strength of believers in this land. That's gonna speak volumes to people watching. Wow, they prayed for their persecutors. They suffered well. So I believe Paul was setting up the church for a more peaceful experience for the next few months or so however long it took. I'm pretty sure the leadership of that community didn't come knocking on Lydia's door trying to throw them all in prison for a long time because of what they went through and their mistakes. God will vindicate you, just so you know. Let God fight your battles. Let me give you some takeaways and we're gonna respond today. Can I, can I encourage you today to not, not unplug from coming to God, even applying the the message or also the message we got before this sermon that God's speaking to us about. I wanna respond in worship today because I believe that while we're not in physical prison right now, obviously, because we're here at church, hopefully you don't feel like you're in prison being here. That'd be weird. Some of the kids in the nursery, they may feel like that a little bit. So we're not, you know, how do you apply this? You know, Obviously, there's a lot of great ways we can apply this. I mean, there could be a chance one day where we face persecution for our beliefs and preaching the gospel, right? There are people in other countries facing this, so they're gonna really, really be encouraged by this scripture that God shows up. But for us today, metaphorically speaking, what if we're in some other kind of prison? The prison of sin or the, a mental prison, an emotional prison, Maybe there's a physical ailment that has been keeping you captive that perhaps God is wanting to deliver you from, from one of those things today. Do you know that he can meet you right where you are in the inner places of your heart and set you free? And there's so many things that you could be worried or afraid about. I'm gonna have the worship team come up. 
Why don't, we, why don't we stand together here? That was quick, wasn't it? Yeah, wow. We're not even preaching only 25 minutes. How is that possible? Because, you know, we need the word to work in us right now. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to work on us right now. And I would ask that you'd even consider others, but don't, don't cop out on, you know, oh, well, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for someone else then so I don't have to expose my own heart to God right now. So don't hear me say that. If there's something that you're dealing with, God wants to meet you where you are. If there's someone else that needs prayer, please intercede for them today. I believe that the Holy Spirit will pour out upon all people, that he will wake people up to come back to him. He's doing that, my friends. He's doing that. God is waking people up to see their need for Jesus Christ. People are watching how we're being treated too as Christians and they're waking up and they're seeing the injustice of that. Let God fight that battle. The way we fight is we wage war with prayer and the truth and so many other things. And we, we see people come to Christ. That's how we get one more on the team, on team God, you know? One of the things I live by is I wanna, I wanna empty hell and fill heaven. That's how I fight. But even as believers, we can be like stuck. So is there something in your life that he wants to set you free from today? Would you raise a hand if you need prayer because we're gonna pray for each other right where we are. Yeah, this, I mean, the first service, same thing. Hands are going up everywhere. And just, just stay where you are. We're gonna create an altar right where you are. If you need to come down, you wanna come down, please do. Hold that hand up and keep it up because I want, I want those around them to respectfully place a hand on their shoulder and pray for them. Begin to move to that place, to where they are. Thank you, God, for what you're gonna do right now. We're doing some ministry together, amen? We have some people pray for them right here. What must I do to be saved? God doesn't want you to set you free from some struggle. He wants you to set you, set you free from sin and death and give you everlasting life. What must I do to be saved? Believe and repent. Believe in Jesus Christ and unbelieve everything else you've believed and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you need to do that today, please raise a hand so we can pray with you as well. Raise a hand. I see hands going up a little higher just so people know you're in good company right now. We want to see salvations. If that's you, raise a hand. We're going to pray for you. Amen. Let's just begin to pray for those around us. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, do a work in this place by your Holy Spirit. Only your Spirit can do. God, thank you that you taught us in your word today that when we're going through a trial, we should pray and worship. That God, in your timing, you will open the doors. You will set us free. You will be glorified. You will vindicate us, God, in your timing, Lord. Do that today, Lord. We pray for healing physically, God, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, in every way, God, begin to heal today. Lord, for those who have carried things because of harm done to them, Lord, I pray you would set them free in Jesus' name. For anyone dealing with demonic oppression or possession, God, expose it, Lord, and deliver them in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, set them free online or in this place, Lord. Do your work today. Lord, set us free. Lord, you've come to set us free. You've come to give us life and life more abundantly. Lord, hear the prayers of your people in this room today. Do an amazing work, Lord, a spiritual work in here. Lord, we're calling upon you because we can't save and we can't fix anyone. You must do it. We ask, Lord, that you would meet them in the inner places of their heart. Some of them may have, feel like they have dungeons in their heart with the things they're battling with, with the struggles they are dealing with, with the habits or addictions they're dealing with. God, set free today by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray they would feel your presence and your Holy Spirit over them. Lord, I pray that you would baptize them and fill them with your spirit, God. Immerse them in your spirit to help them, God, from this day forward. 
We receive today what you have for us. We take you at your word. We see the story in scripture, God. You care about the jailer. You care about the girl who's enslaved. We thank you, God, for what you're doing. Lord, we want to be set free too. Church, let me speak to you for a moment. I know you're praying, but hear me out real quick. We as believers can struggle with sin again and be enslaved by sin. And it's interesting. The first Greek word used to explain what was this girl was going through was two words, spirit and python. But there's another word the Greeks use for the situation, ventriloquism. Meaning that the girl was like a puppet on the devil's lap being used. Don't go to puppets for your own guidance or whatever you need, but don't let the devil make you a puppet either. And don't let sin do that either. <laughs> Confess your sins, the word of God says. And he's faithful and just to cleanse you and to forgive you for all unrighteousness. That's what scripture says. Confess your sins to him. And he is faithful and just and holy to forgive you and cleanse you. So confess those things today and be forgiven and ask the Holy Spirit to help you live a new life. Lord, do that today too. Oh God, let us not be mastered by sin, but mastered by you and your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for setting us free. Help us to live free indeed, because your word says that. Lord, help us to not water down what we're going through, to not think it's serious. It is. And Lord, you've called us to live a, a stronger life for you. You've called us to live a life of freedom in you, in your safety, Lord. We pray for freedom, God. We pray against the enemy right now that would make us feel afraid of being different or changing to be holy, but it's so good to be holy, God. It feels so good, Lord, to live at peace with you. God, we pray, Lord, for the fruit of holiness, the sense of peace and confidence in your love and your security, Lord. Thank you, God. And thank you, God, for meeting us even in that dark struggle. You meet us there to pull us out. Lord, thank you for speaking to us today. And now we're gonna worship you by faith. We're gonna praise you by faith, believing, God, that we can come to you no matter what we're going through, that, Lord, you deserve the praise in the, in the hardest or darkest of night. You deserve the praise no matter what we're going through. And I pray as we worship God, I pray, God, that chains would break, chains would fall, fear and depression, Lord, would go, and that, Lord, we'd be set free. So, Lord, we worship you.